The storm raged as I drove along the deserted highway, the windshield wipers struggling to keep up with the deluge. It had been a long day at the conference, and all I wanted was to reach my Airbnb cabin and crash for the night. My GPS indicated another 30 miles to go when I saw him. A lone figure, drenched and shivering, thumb extended in a desperate plea for a ride. I hesitated but then remembered the storm. Leaving someone out here could be dangerous. I slowed down and rolled down the passenger window. Need a lift, I shouted over the roar of the rain. The man, probably in his mid-thirties, nodded gratefully. Thanks, my car broke down a few miles back. He climbed in, shaking off the water like a dog. I'm Mark, I said, trying to be polite. Alex, he replied, offering a damp handshake. His grip was firm, his eyes dark and intense. We drove in silence for a while. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something off about Alex, but I chalked it up to my own tiredness and the eerie atmosphere created by the storm. So, where are you headed? I asked to break the silence. Just trying to get to the next town, he said. I was visiting a friend, but my car had other plans. Rough night for it, I said, glancing at him. He seemed normal enough, if a bit quiet. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling that he was studying me too intently. We finally arrived at the cabin, a cozy but isolated retreat nestled among the trees. The storm showed no signs of letting up, and I felt a pang of guilt at the thought of sending Alex back out into it. You're welcome to stay here tonight, I offered. There's a guest room. Thanks, I really appreciate it, he said, his smile not quite reaching his eyes. Inside, I showed Alex to the guest room and then collapsed on the couch with a sigh. The storm pounded against the windows, and the howling wind made the cabin creak. I tried to focus on the TV, but my mind kept wandering back to Alex. I decided to call it a night and headed to my room. I locked the door behind me, feeling a bit silly for doing so, but unable to shake the sense of unease. I fell into a restless sleep, the storm outside a constant, unsettling presence. Sometime in the early hours, I awoke to a strange sound. It was subtle, like someone moving stealthily through the cabin. I strained to listen, but heard nothing further. Just my imagination, I told myself. The next morning, I found Alex in the kitchen making coffee. Morning, he said cheerfully. I hope you don't mind. I figured I owed you at least a cup. Not at all, I replied, though the sight of him in my kitchen was jarring. We drank our coffee in awkward silence, and I couldn't help but notice how Alex seemed to know his way around the kitchen too well for someone who had just arrived. So, what do you do, Mark? He asked suddenly. Business consultant, I said. You? Freelancer, he replied vaguely. As the day wore on, I noticed more oddities. Items in my cabin seemed to have been moved. My laptop, which I was sure I had left on the dining table, was now on the coffee table. My phone had been plugged into its charger, though I didn't remember doing that. I decided to confront Alex. Did you move my stuff? I asked, trying to keep my tone casual. Alex looked at me innocently. No, why would I? Must have been the wind or something. The wind? Inside the cabin? His response made no sense, and the unease that had been simmering beneath the surface began to boil over. That night the power went out. The storm had knocked out the electricity, plunging the cabin into darkness. I found a flashlight and some candles, and Alex and I sat in the dim light, the atmosphere growing increasingly tense. Tell me about your family, Mark, Alex said suddenly. The question was innocuous enough, but the way he asked it made my skin crawl. Why do you want to know, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady. Just making conversation he said with a smile that seemed more like a smirk. I didn't sleep that night. Every time I closed my eyes, I imagined Alex creeping through the cabin, watching me. The next morning I resolved to get rid of him. The storm had finally passed, and it was time for him to go. You should be able to get a tow truck now, I told him over breakfast. I'll give you a ride to town. Alex didn't argue, which only heightened at my suspicion. As we drove, he started talking again, this time about my dog, Charlie. How do you know about my dog? I demanded. Social media, he said casually. You post about him a lot. 
I hadn't mentioned Charlie to him, and my social media profiles were private. My heart pounded as I realized how much he knew about me. Too much. We reached the small town, and I dropped him off at a diner. Thanks for the ride, he said, that unsettling smile back on his face. Take care, Mark. I watched him walk away, a sense of relief washing over me, but the feeling didn't last. When I returned to the cabin, I found my laptop open to my email, with a draft message addressed to me. The subject line read, You can't hide. Panic set in. I grabbed my phone to call the police, but it was dead, though I had charged it overnight. Alex had tampered with it. My mind raced as I tried to figure out what to do next. Then I heard the door creak open. Alex stood there, a sinister smile on his face. Miss me. Fear gripped me. I backed away, trying to think of a way out. Alex advanced slowly, enjoying my terror. You can't escape, Mark, he said. I know everything about you. Desperation fueled my next move. I grabbed a heavy lamp and swung it at him. He dodged, but I managed to hit his shoulder. He stumbled, and I took the chance to run. I fled into the woods, the remnants of the storm turning the ground to mud. Alex was right behind me, but I knew the area better. I led him in circles, trying to lose him in the dense trees. Eventually, I reached a road and flagged down a passing car. The driver, a kind older woman, let me use her phone to call the police. When they arrived, Alex was long gone, but they assured me they would find him. I returned to the cabin with the officers, who found evidence of Alex's obsession. Photos of me, printouts of my social media posts, even a detailed schedule of my daily routine. The police promised to keep me informed, but the damage was done. I couldn't stay at the cabin. I packed my things and left, vowing to be more careful about what I shared online. Even now, back in the city, I can't shake the feeling that I'm being watched. Alex might be gone, but his shadow lingers, a constant reminder of how fragile our sense of security can be. I arrived at the rustic cabin nestled deep in the Great Smoky Mountains, near Gatlinburg, Tennessee, with high hopes for a peaceful retreat. The late October foliage painted the landscape in vibrant hues of red and gold, an idyllic setting for my creative escape. As a 32-year-old freelance writer, I longed for solitude to work on my novel. Greg, the host, greeted me warmly. An overly friendly man in his 50s, he gave me a quick tour of the cabin. He highlighted its old-world charm and the tranquility it offered. Perfect for creative work, he said. But I noticed he glossed over certain parts of the property, particularly the basement. I didn't think much of it at the time, eager to settle in and enjoy the stunning views from the windows. That first night, I settled into the cozy living room. The crackling fireplace provided a comforting backdrop as I began outlining my novel. The tranquility, however, was soon disrupted by faint noises outside. I dismissed them as forest animals or the house settling. But an uneasy feeling began to creep in. While making tea, I noticed strange carvings on the coffee table, odd symbols, and the faint words, Help me. I attributed them to previous renters and tried to brush off the unease, convincing myself it was just harmless graffiti. The next morning I decided to explore the cabin more thoroughly. I discovered more carvings and messages hidden in inconspicuous places, under the bed, on the inside of the closet door, even carved into the wooden beams. The messages included phrases like, don't trust him, and more of the strange symbols I couldn't decipher. Feeling unnerved, I called Greg. He reassured me it was just the work of bored teenagers, his casual dismissal doing little to ease my growing discomfort. Still, I tried to focus on my writing, pushing the disturbing discoveries to the back of my mind. Curiosity got the better of me, leading me to the local library in Gatlinburg. There, I began researching the symbols and messages, uncovering stories about Mark, a hiker who had stayed at the cabin two months prior and disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Newspaper articles and police reports hinted at foul play, but provided no concrete evidence. Mark's disappearance was shrouded in mystery with locals whispering about the cabin's dark history. Determined to find out more, 
I felt a growing sense of dread, but also a need to uncover the truth. That night, as I tried to focus on my writing, the noises intensified. I heard footsteps outside, followed by shadows moving past the windows. Panic set in as I locked all the doors and windows, but the noises persisted, now seeming to come from inside the cabin. My heart pounded as I listened to the creaking floorboards and faint whispers. I spent a sleepless night clutching a kitchen knife, every sound amplifying my fear. The next day, while searching for clues, I discovered a hidden compartment in the bedroom. Inside, I found Mark's journal, detailing his own terrifying experiences at the cabin. He wrote about Greg acting strangely and feeling watched, just as I had. The journal mentioned a hidden room in the basement that Greg never spoke of. My hands trembled as I read Mark's final entries, describing his growing fear and suspicion of Greg. Determined to find the hidden room, I steeled myself for what I might uncover. Summoning my courage, I ventured into the basement. I found a concealed door leading to a room filled with disturbing photos and belongings of past guests. The horror of the situation dawned on me as I realized the extent of Greg's sinister activities. At that moment, Greg arrived, his demeanor shifting from friendly to menacing as he saw what I had discovered. You shouldn't have come here, he hissed. Fear turned to adrenaline as I fought to escape, dodging his grasp and sprinting through the forest. I stumbled onto the main road, flagging down a passing car and urging the driver to call the police. I provided the authorities with Mark's journal and the evidence I found. The police searched the cabin, arresting Greg and uncovering his gruesome secrets. Multiple disappearances were finally explained, but the nightmare was far from over. Back in Atlanta, I received an anonymous package containing a photo of myself taken during my stay at the cabin. The chilling implication was clear. An accomplice remained at large. My harrowing story was published, bringing attention to the dangers I faced and the unresolved elements of the case. Though I continued my writing career, the experience left me haunted, constantly looking over my shoulder. The cabin was shut down, but rumors persisted about the lingering presence of those who vanished there. I could never shake the feeling that someone was watching me, a sinister reminder of my time in the secluded cabin. The mansion stood grandly against the twilight sky as we arrived, our weekend getaway filled with promises of luxury and relaxation. It was Emma who had found the place on Airbnb, a sprawling estate far removed from the bustle of the city. Mr. Gray, the host, greeted us with a warm smile and a firm handshake, his eyes crinkling at the corners in what I hoped was genuine friendliness. Inside, the mansion was even more impressive. Marble floors, chandeliers, and plush furniture gave it an almost surreal air of opulence. This is amazing, Sarah whispered, her eyes wide with awe. We spent the first few hours exploring. Jake, ever the adventurer, was determined to see every inch of the place. It was in the basement that we found the locked door. What's behind there? Jake wondered aloud. His curiosity peaked. Probably just storage, Tom shrugged but Jake was already fiddling with a bobby pin trying to pick the lock. Jake, don't, Emma started, but the lock clicked open. The room beyond was a stark contrast to the rest of the mansion. Dimly lit, it was filled with shelves of old photographs, personal belongings, and various tools that made my stomach churn. What is this? Lisa breathed, horror evident in her voice. Evidence, Emma said, her face pale evidence of crimes. Panic set in quickly. We need to leave, Sarah said, her voice trembling. We rushed upstairs, only to find that our phones had no signal and the landline was dead. This can't be happening, I muttered, my mind racing. Mr. Gray appeared then, his friendly demeanor gone. What are you doing in my basement, he demanded, his voice cold. We, we found something, Jake stammered. We need to leave. You're not going anywhere, Mr. Gray said, his eyes now hard and dangerous. You've damaged my property and trespassed. We'll pay for any damages, Emma tried to negotiate, but Mr. Gray was unmoved. We ran to the car, but it wouldn't start. Jake popped the hood and swore. The engine's been tampered with, he said, his voice grim. He's going to kill us, 
Sarah whispered, her eyes filling with tears. We need to stick together, Emma said, her voice steady despite the fear in her eyes. We need to find a way to defend ourselves. We split up to search the mansion for anything that could be used as a weapon. I ended up in the kitchen, grabbing the largest knife I could find. Lisa found a heavy candlestick, and Tom came back with a golf club. We need a plan, Emma said. We can't just wait for him to come to us. We decided to set a trap in the basement. It was risky, but it was the only place we knew he would come to check. We hid, waiting in tense silence. Every creak of the house made my heart jump. Hours seemed to pass before we heard footsteps descending the stairs. Mr. Gray entered the basement, his flashlight cutting through the darkness. Come out, come out, wherever you are, he taunted. At Emma's signal, we attacked. The struggle was brutal. Mr. Gray was strong and fought back with a ferocity that seemed inhuman, but our desperation gave us strength. Jake managed to knock the flashlight from his hand, plunging the room into near darkness. I swung the knife, cutting his arm, while Tom landed a solid blow to his head with the golf club. Mr. Gray fell to the floor unconscious. We need to tie him up, Emma said, her voice shaky but determined. Using some of the ropes we found in the basement, we bound his hands and feet. With Mr. Gray secured, we searched his pockets and found his keys. Emma grabbed them and ran upstairs, unlocking the front door. We stumbled out into the cold night air, running down the long driveway towards the nearest town. A kind older woman driving by stopped when she saw us. We must have looked like a group of escapees, which, in a way, we were. She let us use her phone to call the police. The authorities arrived quickly and arrested Mr. Gray. The evidence in the basement was enough to link him to several missing persons cases. He had used the mansion as a perfect crime scene, luring guests who would never be heard from again. We gave our statements, each of us recounting the horrifying events. The police assured us that Mr. Gray would face justice, but the experience left us all deeply shaken. Back in the city, I couldn't stop thinking about how close we had come to becoming his next victims. The mansion, once a symbol of luxury and escape, had turned into a nightmare. We learned the hard way that safety is an illusion, and that sometimes the most beautiful places can hide the darkest secrets. As we went our separate ways, we made a pact to always be cautious about where we stayed and whom we trusted. The memory of that weekend would haunt us forever, a grim reminder of the fragility of life and the importance of vigilance. The business trip to Austin was supposed to be a routine stopover in my busy life. I had booked a chic downtown apartment through Airbnb, seeking a little comfort amid the whirlwind of meetings and networking events. When I arrived, the August heat hit me like a wave, but the apartment was a cool oasis, stylishly decorated and offering a perfect view of the city's skyline. My host, Olivia, greeted me warmly. She was in her early forties, with a charm that put me at ease. She gave a brief tour her voice soft and friendly, asking about my plans in Austin. I mentioned the conference, and she nodded approvingly, offering restaurant recommendations and tips on navigating the city. That first night, exhausted from travel and a long day of meetings, I returned to the apartment. I double-checked the locks before settling into bed, eager for a good night's sleep. The faint noises from outside didn't bother me. I attributed them to the city's nightlife. Little did I know that night was the beginning of a nightmare. I woke up the next morning feeling disoriented. The sunlight streamed through the windows, casting a harsh light on the chaos around me. My laptop, wallet, and travel documents were gone. The sleek modern room felt suddenly foreign and hostile. Panic gripped me as I realized the apartment door was slightly ajar. I had locked it, hadn't I? Desperation clawed at me as I called Olivia. She answered on the first ring, her voice filled with concern. She sounded genuinely shocked and advised me to report the incident to the police immediately. Her reaction seemed sincere, but a nagging doubt had already started to form in my mind. Detective Ramirez from the Austin PD arrived shortly after. He was a seasoned officer, his eyes sharp and assessing. He found no signs of forced entry, which meant someone with a key had accessed the apartment. Olivia arrived as well her expression a mask of worry and empathy. She cooperated fully with the investigation, but something about her demeanor seemed off to me. 
she was too composed, too prepared. As the hours passed, my frustration and fear grew. I decided to take matters into my own hands. I began researching similar incidents in the area, hoping to find a pattern. My search led me to online forums and news articles about other travelers who had been robbed in downtown Austin Airbnb rentals. The stories were eerily similar to mine, right down to the friendly host and the absence of forced entry. I contacted two previous victims, Jennifer and Marcus, who had stayed at different properties but described experiences that mirrored mine. Jennifer, a 28-year-old consultant, had lost her laptop and jewelry. Marcus, a 40-year-old IT specialist, had been stripped of his expensive gadgets and cash. Both had stayed at properties managed by different hosts, but the descriptions of those hosts bore an uncanny resemblance to Olivia. A chilling realization dawned on me. Olivia had managed other properties under different aliases, orchestrating a series of robberies to fund her lavish lifestyle. Determined to find proof, I visited the addresses of these properties, each one connected back to her, the pattern becoming disturbingly clear. Armed with this evidence, I confronted Olivia. I expected denial, but her face darkened with anger instead. You shouldn't have dug into this, she hissed, her friendly facade crumbling. She was no longer the charming host, but a cornered predator. I had informed Detective Ramirez of my findings earlier, and he arrived just in time to detain Olivia. Her reaction was a mix of fury and resignation, as if she knew her game was finally up. During the interrogation, the true depth of her deceit was revealed. Olivia had copied keys and monitored guests' activities, striking when they were most vulnerable. The investigation led to a storage unit where Olivia had stashed stolen items, including my belongings. Seeing my things again brought a wave of relief, but the knowledge of how close I had come to a far worse fate left a lingering fear. With Olivia arrested and charged with multiple counts of theft and fraud, I felt a sense of justice. Detective Ramirez commended my determination and gave me advice on future travel safety. Yet the ordeal had changed me. I returned home, shaken but relieved, vowing to share my story to warn others about the dangers lurking behind a friendly smile. Back in my everyday life, the shadows of that weekend in Austin stayed with me. Nightmares plagued my sleep, and I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I became an advocate for safer travel practices, writing articles and giving talks about my experience. Olivia's arrest led to a crackdown on similar scams, making travel safer for others. But I knew the deception that had almost ensnared me could never be entirely eradicated. Ethan's Law, they called it. New regulations for short-term rentals, inspired by my ordeal. The name felt strange, almost surreal. As if the horror had happened to someone else but I remembered Olivia's cold eyes and the terror of waking up to find my world turned upside down. The incident stayed with me, a constant reminder that sometimes the most charming places and people hide the